Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. This is the Next Real, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies tonight on the show. It's another in our series of the films of Betty Davis with Joseph Mankiewicz's 1950 film All About Eve. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app or join us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you turned up for another in our series of The Bit Parts of Marilyn Monroe, then you're in the right place. First, tune in for The Next Reel's Instagram, hashtag PonyPrize, hashtag Guess the Movie Challenge. And with that, let's check in with Games Master Stephen Smart, who is stuck on the side of the road up in New England due to, quote, running out of gas, unquote, to find out who won this week. Hey guys, this week's movie was Cleaner from 2007, directed by Rennie Harlan and starring Samuel Jackson, Ed Harris and Eva Mendes. Congrats to at Cotton Science who guessed it, after I gave it away, on Image 3. You're entered once again into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday, so thanks guys and see you later. We got a blot spot uh, this week, and it really, I think it uncovers some deep emotional issues with our dear friend of the show, Ben Lott. I think it shows great emotional strength. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, Ben says, call me overly sappy if you must, but I connected emotionally with Now Voyager. I agree with Pete that it's tough to swallow these romances based on an affair, but I thought this film handled it in a unique and satisfying way through the daughter. Betty Davis shows such amazing range that now I'm sold on her as the legendary leading lady. This was a solid character drama, and I'm glad you guys made me watch it. Your rank 219, my rank 66. That is a huge win. I love it. I, it's been so long since we recorded this because uh, we're we're off schedule a little bit. I don't even remember what was our big loss that caused it to fall to two nineteen. Well, whatever our middle block is right now, I feel like yeah. it's Mad Max or the Road Warrior. I feel like that's yeah. become our new Oh Brother block. Yep, yep. It makes it okay. hard. It makes tough. it hard. It's tough to creep over that hump. Uh, that's the truth. Oh well, Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. <laughs> So I'm pretty excited for my trailer. Pete. I knew you would be. As I should be. I'm sorry. I didn't say that. I didn't say that right. Let me say <laughs> I knew you would be. And as I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> my trailer is uh, the new uh, Disney live action remake of Beauty and the Beast. Um, you know, it's this thing and it's going to keep happening. Disney is going to keep doing this. And, you know, I'm sure other studios are really going to get into it too and try finding things that they have done in one form or another that they can adapt and uh, get more money out of it. It's just, it's, you know, the nature of the business is going to happen. People aren't going to be able to stop it. And as long as they're doing it in a way where they bring on good people to write and direct it, they bring on good actors to perform it, and they really work on creating a story that works, I'm okay with it. The Jungle Book, I thought, was really entertaining. I was, uh, in, I was surprised that I enjoyed Cinderella because I really overall don't like that story much. Um, and, you know, it's something that they're going to keep doing and I'm okay with it if they keep doing it well, and it's and it looks like Beauty and the Beast is kind of going along that route. I'm a little creeped out by some of the little CG, uh, like the teapot, you know, and the all those guys, Cogsworth and Lumiere, and all those. They look a little off-putting, uh, but I think the Beast looks really interesting. I like what they did that, and of course we have lovely Emma Watson as Belle. I think she's great, and Luke Evans is Gaston. It's a really interesting cast. They're doing something. That we've seen, but I think it looks really strong, so I'm quite excited. What do you think? Yeah, I, I am too. I don't <laughs> say I'm quite excited. I, you know, and I don't mean to be hard on it in in any way, shape, or form. I really don't. And I know it's going to be be a beautiful spectacle. I'm sure. I was not that smitten with Cinderella, but I like you. Don't like the story at all. And um, what I expected with Cinderella was an actual like attempt to make let's say, a full live-action film out of it, and what they gave me was, you know, the, the mice, and the mice with the sunglasses, and um, I, I just was not keen on on their interpretation of, of that film. And so I, I come to this with a bit of trepidation. I, I'm of an age where when the first time I saw Beauty and the Beast, the animated film, I was really moved by it. I thought the music was beautiful. I'm a sucker for that stuff, and... Um, I probably saw it on a date that that couldn't hurt, uh, and uh, and and so you know I'll go into it with kind of eyes wide shut. How about that? Well, at least you're going to go into it, and I think that's good. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's good. <laughs> I count that as a win. It's uh, yeah, I you know I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with this thing. It's going to be a big uh, opening next March, March 17th. Actually, all right around then, pretty much around the world, it's going to be a big splash. I have a feeling that you and I have brought trailers that uh, will meet the other in the same spirit. <laughs> uh, my trailer tonight, Andy, is uh, the great big film uh, from your favorite and mine, but more mine, uh, <laughs> Luc Besson, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Uh, this is the story of time-traveling agent Valerian, sent to investigate a galactic empire along with his partner, Laureline. It is based on the comic book by Pierre Christin and Jean-Claude Mézières, uh, and the, the adaptation was done by Luc Besson himself. Uh, stars Cara Delevingne, uh, Dane DeHaan, and Ethan Hawke, busiest man in Hollywood, uh, along with Rihanna and Clive Owen and John Goodman and Rutger Hauer. I'll say that again, Rutger Hauer. <laughs> uh, so it, it's got uh, quite 
quite a cast. I, I'm not lying to you. Herbie Hancock is in this movie. Herbie Hancock and Rutger Hauer who isn't are both in, the in this movie. movie. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but it this is one of those films. It is a Luc Besson space film. It is huge. It is incredibly colorful. It is just rich in jumping action and aliens <laughs> that are incredibly fat faces and a lot of jiggling alien flesh when they laugh and crazy flight scenes and cities that appear to be built on stilts where you never see the ground. It's everything that you imagine Luc Besson really likes to bury himself in. I think, you know, worst case scenario, it's going to be a gorgeous work of CG art, right? It's going to be beautiful. It'll be a perfect test disc for home 4K, right? I mean, this is going to be <laughs> the new definitive, uh, uh, you know, best case for color and sound, I imagine. Even if the movie sucks. Is it another fifth element? I don't know. I'm still more bullish on that movie than you are. Uh, I know, but uh, I'm, I got to tell you, I'm kind of excited about this. I, I really have grown uh, uh, quite an affinity for Dane DeHane. Uh, and that uh, Cara Delevingne, I, uh, I think she is, I'm just smitten by her. I think she's fantastic. She's the kind of person I would really want to sit next to at lunch in high school, but would never have the courage to do it. So I'm glad she's in movies. <laughs> so you can pretend. So I can pretend that's exactly right. <laughs> anyway, I, go, go ahead, Andy. I feel like I'm talking too long because I'm afraid of what you're going to say. Go ahead, lay it on me. I, when, when the Fifth Element uh, trailer came out, I was like, wow, eye candy, it's gorgeous, I can't wait to see it. And you know the movie really disappointed me. Um, this one, same thing. It, the movie looks like eye candy. It looks gorgeous, it looks like a really fun, interesting story. And I hope that it is. I hope, all I can do is be in the same place you are, I'll go see with my eyes wide shut, as you say it. Uh, it <laughs> It, uh, yeah, I mean, I want it to be good. I want it to be fun. I know Luc Besson has this wacky sense of humor that just never works for me. And that's what I'm afraid of, is that I'm going to watch this and all of a sudden Ruby Rod is going to show up. And I'll just really Ruby be Rod! Upset. Maybe, maybe Herbie Hancock plays Ruby Rod's long lost <laughs> twin cousin or something. I dare to dream. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, so, this, yeah. this film opens uh, July 1st in Hong Kong and they get it about three weeks early. Uh, the rest of the world gets it starting in its uh, global rollout on July 20th. It'll hit the U.S. July 21st. France, Netherlands, Turkey, July 26th, 27th. That's what we've got so far. Uh, and with that, Andy, cut, print. What happens in the next reel? Does Andy get dragged off screaming to a snake pit? Honored members, ladies and gentlemen, for distinguished achievement in the theater, the Sarah Siddons Award to Miss Eve Harry. I'm going to take you to Margo. Oh, no. Oh, yes, she's got to meet you. She's quite a girl, this what's-her-name. Eve, I've forgotten they grew that way. I take it she read well. It wasn't a reading, it was a performance. Brilliant, vivid, something made of music and fire. And how nice. After all you've said, don't you know that part was written for Margot? It might have been 15 years ago. It's my part now. You're quite a girl. You think? Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. All About Eve, Andy, 1950, from writer-director Joseph L. Mankiewicz, uh, starring that, Betty is that Davis. how he likes it? Mankiewicz. Eh? How do you say it? Mankiewicz? Mankiewicz. Just Mankiewicz. 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 Let's just call him Joe. <laughs> Joe, uh, Joey L., Joey from the Block. Uh, and it stars Betty Davis, the subject of our series, and Baxter, George Sanders, Celeste Holm, and many other wonderful people, including Marilyn Monroe. Uh, uh, just a little bit of Marilyn Monroe. Just a bit. Um, <laughs> this is a series uh, dedicated to your efforts to uh, make me a Betty Davis believer. And I'm going to tell you this right up front, Andy. I don't want to. I don't want to to back pocket your success. I really enjoyed this movie. Really, really, really. So my hat is off to you, sir. Well, again, I I appreciate the uh, the retroactive uh, description of this of the this particular series. 
<laughs> you know, it's just going to stay that way, right? I mean, I, I know just, it is. This I is, know it is. This is. You've done a great, jo- a great service to your to king and country. That's what I planned here <laughs> by convincing me. <laughs> Luckily, you had seen this one before, so I, yes. I guess I picked well. <laughs> well done. I uh, really enjoy watching this film. It's never been dull. It's just a, a really solid film from the, from beginning to end, and I think it's really. A very prescient film, and it still is completely um, applicable. I mean, this is just really how this industry particularly uh, – well, I, I shouldn't say just theater, but I mean film too. All of it works. I mean, this is kind of you know the, the way that the young people try to kind of come in and feed off of the old people and take over and everything. It's just uh, the nature of it. And I think uh, what I find so interesting about this film is that this is a story where our protagonist, Margot Channing, gets what she wants. She finally uh, accepts her age, that she's 40 years old. She gets a happily married life with Bill. She's reintegrated with all of her friends and, you know, and kind of has exposed Eve as this evil woman. She's she's gotten everything she wants. Eve gets everything she wants. She gets all the parts. She gets all the praise. She you know at the beginning and end we see her with the Sarah Siddons Award. Everybody is getting what they want in this film. Yet it still is so biting, and it's such a, a darkly twisted vision of this particular industry. I, I love that. That's the story. It's like a very positive, happy story, yet it just feels like there's this little twist on it. And I really think that's very clever of Mankiewicz and the way he wrote it. I, I think so, too. I think this ends up being a movie that's subversively about so many more social issues than... than and it it wears some of those social issues right on its sleeve, right? I mean, some of the, the monologue and the, the speech in the car where we have this conversation about what it's like to be a professional woman and the challenges of being a woman and, and uh, you know, these kinds of things. It's a, It's a story about so much of that and the challenges that women in this capacity faced in 1950 in the 40s um, and uh, and the challenges that they went through to overcome those things only to find happiness when they stopped pursuit of those things. Uh, I think that ended up being a, a, an interesting kind of story um, beneath the story that I really liked. I really, really liked um, the, the approach to this. Um, I, I think it is, uh, for me, the standout is that Betty Davis is in just the right role in this film. I think she is um, she has aged into over the course of the films that we've watched together, she's aged into this position as sort of the grand dame of of the film and she plays so well um, off of Ann Baxter uh, who just dominates from her sweetness to her absolute diabolical, uh, pursuit of success, uh, the two of them together are just enchanting uh, on screen for me. Not to mention Addison DeWitt's George, uh, uh, Addison DeWitt's and and Karen Richards, uh, played by George Sanders and Celeste Holm. Their uh, sort of interchange uh, with these other two characters, keeping them moving forward or or becoming you know obstacles. I just found myself really enchanted by them. It was a perfect opportunity for Betty Davis. Uh, you know, she was kind of at a lull in her career. I mean, she had hit really big in the late 30s, beginning of the 40s. And then uh, bef- just before this, she had kind of been in a string of flops. Things just weren't uh, as good. Or, or I don't know if she was picking bad scripts or or what, but it just or they just weren't clicking. And she was kind of in a place where, you know, our last films we had talked about, she was really at the top of her game. Now, she wasn't even uh, the really kind of the first choice. And when she came on board, everybody was warning Mankiewicz against her, saying, oh, watch out, man, she's going to be a tough one. But she was kind of at this lull, and so she needed this. And she was the right age to play uh, Margot Channing. And the fact that all of that worked together and that she gave so much of herself to the role, I think, created just an indelible performance for her here. And yeah, she's just brilliant. It's a great film. You're right. Every Everyone in it just works so well. I, You know, it's fascinating to me that she was coming off of such a place of struggle in her career when, in fact, I think she was so much better in this role than anything we've watched so far, than the other two movies we've watched so far. I, I just absolutely bought everything about her. She just, she, she owned it. It was, it was wonderful. Script, as we've already mentioned, it is written by Joey from the Block, 
um, based on the short story, The Wisdom of Eve by Mary Orr. Uh, what do we make of this adaptation? Uh, you know, it sounds like uh, it was it was uncredited, and I don't know if that's a WGA thing. I don't know how that whole thing works, if they felt that it wasn't enough of an adaptation. I know Mary Orr got paid for the adaptation, so it's just kind of strange. But, um, I mean, Mary Orr, she was actually, um, she had a friend, Elizabeth Bergner, who is an actress, who actually had this happen to her. Uh, Martina Lawrence, who I guess was a real fan of, of Bergner's, and really kind of pursued all of this and kind of tried to take over her career and um and Mary Orr kind of took that story and wrote this this short story um about that and I guess Martina Lawrence uh really kind of for the rest of her life blamed Mary Orr for her mess of a life even though really Orr really had nothing to do with it Martina Lawrence was just really crazy a uh, very, uh, very interesting story. But, um, you know, Mankiewicz, he had a, uh, a tricky relationship with his own brother, Herman Mankiewicz, who, um, you know, was one of the, the people behind Citizen Kane and uh, won an award for that. And Mankiewicz, uh, Joseph Mankiewicz, kind of had a, uh, you know, a little bit of resentment against his brother. There's that competition thing. And I think he, when he adapted it, it wasn't a direct adaptation, but it was, it was somewhat along the same lines. But I think he pulled a lot from his own life to kind of uh, get into this particular story. So, um, I, you know, it was, a, it was a story that he had a lot of connection to. Uh, he was a, uh, a New Yorker who was in Hollywood he, he, you know, so he was kind of, he wasn't in the theater circles, but he kind of, being from New York, he kind of, it, it fit for him to tell that story there, even though it also could very easily be transposed over to anyone in, in Hollywood. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I think he really created a solid adaptation here. And I think it's a really interestingly structured script. And knowing that his brother um, what was behind Citizen Kane, you can really see that he kind of pulled some of his brother's uh, storytelling style into this one, as far as the way that the, the story gets told by multiple voices. You have all these different flashbacks. It's a pretty interesting structure of this film, don't you think? Well, it is, and that's an interesting point, right? These are two two structural tropes, right? The voiceover and the flashback that we've talked about very recently, and in in you know in most cases, uh, they they don't work, or we disagree, and and you were uh, incorrect, probably. Uh, but <laughs> either way, <laughs> uh, but here, I think both of these cases they actually do work. The voiceover is really interesting because the voiceover is not a consistent narrator. It opens with Addison, um, uh, the uh, theater critic. He opens, and they're at the the big ball, and then we have Karen, and then Margot, and then back to Addison over the course of the film. When The, the first time I watched it uh, again, um, I, I thought it got tiresome. I, I, I feel like the, there, was, there ended up being too much uh, uh, narration and, and too much of it. I, because of our delay, I had the opportunity to sit and, and watch this uh, again, and it actually really grew on me. I found it a, a fascinating, as you mentioned, it's a fascinating structure that drives each of the major sections of the film forward, and I think it, it actually works, and maybe it works because they are different narrators. That's, maybe that's what keeps my attention. What do you think? You know, that could be. It's so interesting, the fact that you really have different voices kind of detailing different parts. And and I was kind of torn about it for a little while because it's like, why are they doing that? And yes, it's, I mean, really is because the the person telling each of those stories uh, really needs to be the one telling that story. Karen talking about meeting Eve and introducing her to Margot and kind of all of that. And then Margot has her own little bit. And, and so they all kind of are telling their own little thing, all to tell this this full story. Interestingly, we never hear from Eve, but I, I think that actually um, kind of makes sense because it's this is just all about Eve. You know, it makes sense right. to have everybody's perception of who this person is. And well, I and think Addison it, to too, because it's Addison as a critic, the character in the film, the critic is providing the overarching narrative in the beginning and the end, sort of bookmarking right. the bus with that vo- voiceover. 
Well, because he's the one who really gets the down and dirty as to who Eve is. And he's the one who finally gives us the insight of this of this person. And so we really understand re- kind of just the all of the truths of Eve by the time uh, he's done kind of explaining it to her or, or it to us. And so it's really interesting. I, I think the voiceover actually works um, exceptionally well. And the fact that it's a flashback structure also, I think, works well. And it's an interesting flashback because the narration we see, the freeze frame of Eve as she's about to receive the award, and but we hear Addison talking about her, and then we cut to Addison and the audience still applauding. They're not frozen in time. It's a weird, it's a weird way to kind of introduce that we're stepping back. We have just this freeze frame of Eve, but everyone else keeps going. And that leads us into the flashback that Karen, uh, Karen introduces, taking us to when she meets Eve. It's just, it's a really interesting structure. And all I could think of is uh, considering now Voyagers, like, thank goodness they didn't have that weird book tur- uh, page turning transition. <laughs> Awful. We both had problems with that film. Yeah, yeah. No, this really works well. The fact that this this uh, this flashback starts and catches us up to that exact moment was a a really nice touch, and I I think it 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 didn't distract from the overall story at all. It seems like it's a very kind of standard flashback structure now, where you start the film with something happening, it takes you back to uh, the rest of the story to get you to that point, and then the film finishes up. It's it, and I don't know if this is the first film that really kind of had that particular flashback structure, but I feel like we see that structure a lot now when people do flashbacks. Yeah, I think so too. I don't think we've ever talked about it in that context. It makes me want to just do a quick review of the films we've talked about because I, I, I you know, this is certainly the first one that I remember us talking about. Oh, I, that uh, yeah, I, I'd have to look. I wouldn't be surprised if we've talked about another yeah. one that does the same thing though. Anyhow, directed also by Joey L. Uh, and uh, it seems like uh, he, he might have been a, a tough guy to work with. You know, he he wasn't a tough guy to work with. Um, he was actually a great guy to work with. I think his family thought he was kind of a, a tough father. But oh, tough was guy a, to be raised by. That was tough, what I meant to say. That's tough right. guy to be raised by, yes. <laughs> um, he was a, a woman's director, a, kind of like what everybody said about George Cukor, um, uh, except he said, I'm not the gay one, basically. <laughs> it's kind of how he <laughs> what? would kind of, uh, yeah, demean <sighs> Cukor or just try to, you know, avoid people thinking things of him. But... Uh, Real charmers, um, all these guys, yes. real charmers. Exactly, exactly. But, um, you know, he's he's an interesting guy. He's obviously not a very visual director. This film does not visually stand out um, much in any way. But he's he frames things well. He's got, you know, good groups of people. I think that he does interesting things. I, I, I always find the staircase conversation such a strange one, but I like it. it. Weirdly, it works, but I'm like, why are these people all sitting on the stairs you know the critic is at there. A, the, yes, at a like a fine a party? party. Yeah, it's such a strange place, but weirdly, it, it kind of ends up working. So I don't know. I it's an interesting way that he staged it, but overall, I I think he's not a visual director, but he's a word director. He writes his scripts, he directs them, and he just does a really good job of getting these per- amazing performances from people. He does that. That staircase scene does though stick right out at me because it feels like a solution of efficiency. Like I don't know where we're going to put everybody who needs to be in this scene. Let's all get on the stairs like we're getting ready for a cast photo or something. It just it it didn't didn't work for me. But I will say I loved the it generally there was fantastic staging in certain elements. The theater explosion about the whole understudy issue was beautifully articulated visually. I thought it was great the way they put Eve sort of minimized in the back of every angle. I just thought it was really artfully put. And and it it's such a striking contrast to the clumsy staircase scene uh, when you see something like that as these characters are moving around this theater. It's, it's almost like uh, he just felt more at home in the theater, uh, on the theater set, or in the theater set than he did in this, you know, proscenium house set. Yeah, I, I, I just really enjoyed some elements of it. I thought was, was you know, while most of the film was really safe, this, these sections were, were really standout moments. Sometimes you just kind of lose track of it because, again, the performances are so good. You know, everybody yeah. is just really delivering the top, top performances. Truly. The other thing I wanted to make a note of in particular is the pacing, which I think is really great and rewarding because, you know, the whole this whole single white female story 
is essentially up and we still have 50 minutes left in the play. Like everybody knows everything. All the secrets are out and we still have 50 minutes left in the film. And and in that 50 minutes, we get to experience Eve's rise to prominence. And I think it's a really rewarding um, a, a bit. It doesn't feel like it drops me off a cliff at the end. It feels like it gets me right up to it. It delivers everything I want to know about these characters to the bitter end of the film. And I found that uh, really satisfying. Yeah, absolutely. First shot, last shot. The first shot, we start on a close-up of the Sarah Siddons Award for Distinguished Achievement in the Theater and uh, for Eve Harrington. And then we pull back to an extremely old actor speaking for some time in the dining hall at this big awards presentation full of well-dressed people as Addison DeWitt introduces us to everybody and telling us all about this award. And the last shot, we close in on Phoebe. Phoebe is the the new Eve and she is in standing in this uh, trifold mirror as she and her these hundreds of infinity reflections all mimic her accepting the award she's turning and bowing and uh, the closing title appears over her on screen uh, it is it is this is the closing uh, sort of loop uh, that as history begins to repeat itself uh, it's great it's beginning and ending with the award and, you know, beginning with the award sitting here, ending with a dreamer and all of the dreamers that will follow kind of clinging to this. It's almost like this reflection of this award. It's not even the real thing, uh, you know, as we're seeing it in the reflections. And th- it's just kind of this this thing that people latch on to. I think it's just a, a really brilliant first shot, last shot. In particular, one of, I think, probably the best last shots of a film ever. Wow. I it is it's 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 a powerful last shot that it says so much and it's just so haunting seeing just those hundreds of reflections of this girl as she's bowing and pretending to be uh, you know this amazing awards winner it's it's so interesting I now that I watch this uh, more recently all I could think of was the bling ring and just like yeah. these people who try to take over other people's lives and just kind of you know it's their things but they by just by having them they feel cooler you know that's that's it. And, you know, I, I think to your point, the sandwiching these two messages, the opening message where we have Eve accepting this award and then closing on the fantasy of the next Eve wanting to accept the award is just diabolical and superficial and scary. Uh, and, and I think that makes it it almost I, I found myself wondering as we watch the movie because I'm, I have single white female in my head. I keep wondering who's going to die. And nobody dies in this spoiler. Nobody dies in All About Eve. I know you're hoping somebody would because Betty Davis Davis has done so good in the last two films. That's right. Betty Davis actually kills no one in this movie. Uh, And and yet the end makes it almost as terrifying as if she did. Yeah. Let's talk about the cast. Absolutely. Betty Davis is Margot Channing. Ah, Betty Davis. Yeah, like I like I said, it, she was perfect for this role because she was the right age and she wasn't afraid to show it. Claudette Colbert was originally going to be playing this role, which I, I find interesting, but she was actually on another film and she ended up hurting herself. I think she actually like broke her back or something like really serious and scary. And, uh, yeah, and so they were really kind of at a loss as to what to do. Uh, I think Mankiewicz uh, briefly considered Ingrid Bergman to play the role, but then gave it to Davis, um, who had recently ended her 18-year association with Warner Brothers after, like I said, she had several films that didn't do very well. And uh, she she grabbed at the film at the chance to play in it because she she saw the script, knew it was great, and knew it was perfect for her. And I, I think this is just really, I mean, honestly, I think this is one of, if not her best performance, one of her best performances that she's ever given. Well, I, I certainly am on that side of the, uh, uh, that side of the, of the fence there. She, she plays wonderfully. And again, she plays wonderfully opposite of Anne Baxter as Eve Harrington. Ah, Eve. Or she's... Gertrude Sloshinsky. <laughs> All about Gertrude. <laughs> not, not quite the same ring to it. Oh, yes. Anne uh, Anne was an interesting uh, choice. I I think that um, she was also given the role after Jean Crane, who Mankiewicz wanted uh, to cast, ended up becoming pregnant. And so they went with Anne Baxter, I think, who'd won an Oscar a few years before for Razor's Edge, I believe. Um, 
But Anne Baxter, you know, interestingly, um, uh, we'll talk about the Oscars for this film a little bit later, but Joe Mankiewicz actually really felt that this role was the most complex role in the film and really thought Anne Baxter really kind of deserved an Oscar nomination for this because she gave such an incredible performance and thought actually her performance was better than Davis's because it was so complex. I don't disagree. I think Anne Baxter is really haunting and scary in this. I think that she does this vocal change when she's kind of um, the meek Eve when she's meeting everybody and being so nice and kind and she's very silky. Yeah. And then her voice gets this little brassy uh, kind of gruffness when she's uh, becoming the bossy Eve. And I, I don't know. I just I really enjoy watching her. And there's so many things going on with her transformation and, you know, you have this possible hint uh, that she might be a lesbian, that really interesting scene when she has her friend uh, uh, call uh, uh, Lloyd. And then uh, a- after the success of the phone call, they put their arms around each other and walk up the stairs together. It's like, uh, interesting. So I don't know. I find Eve just such a fascinating character. I, I do too. And so, you know, that's why I jumped in on that because it sounded like you, you were, you were disagreeing with old Joey L. And I totally don't. I think this movie revolves around Ann Baxter's performance and she just dominated. I love the way she is portrayed, the way she's introduced to us, even the way they, they show close ups of her hands, right? Her hands touching one another. And, and, uh, you know, only when they pronounce the winner of the award do we get to see her as a whole human. Uh, it is a, a kind of a haunting and uh, yet superficial reveal that that ends up working really well uh this transformation her her growing the, the growing appearance of her savviness as an actress it's such the it's just a perfect transformation mechanism for the insidiousness that she brings to everybody's life so i i think she's just terrific yeah i agree I'm, i am a little torn though because i i kind of would have liked to see betty davis get an oscar for it but um, just because she's so big and she's so good and she's really a powerhouse. And I think she, the scene in the car with Betty Davis talking to Celeste Holm, I mean, she really opens up and it's really kind of a touching, powerful scene. So let's talk about Celeste Holm as Karen Richards. She has kind of an interesting, um, <laughs> she she plays the best friend of Betty Davis and, and she does a, a great job at it on screen. <laughs> clearly because they really didn't like each other no no and boy that was i i guess the the you know the the story uh on the first day of shooting she says to betty davis good morning and betty davis uh swears to her in response <laughs> and says good manners uh <laughs> you know sarcastically to home and home is apparently very offended and made a point never to speak to betty davis off the set again Apparently, they were not good friends. Apparently, also, uh, you know, they were having a conversation between takes. Well, I think it was the table scene when all four of them were sitting there. And she was talking about something inane, like I think it was Pyrex pots or something like that. And she had some point and Betty Davis looked at her and was like, I don't know how I've lived this long without knowing that. (laughs) It's just... (laughs) Oh, that's so Betty Davis. And Betty Davis was really jealous that Celeste Holm could have such a natural laugh. Like when she was acting, that scene where Celeste Holm just totally bursts into laughter at the table. And and Betty Davis was really jealous. She's like, how do you do that? I just can't do that. And if you think about it, you never really hear Betty Davis laughing. So I guess that's why. She just wasn't much of a laugher. She's a very uh, kind of a, a, you know, a little bit of a tougher lady. I, I think that laughing is not her thing. It's not a natural fit, no, no. Yeah. Um, so she was. I really liked Celeste Holm in here, and I think she is. She rounds out sort of the big three, the trio of ladies, uh, in in the film, and ends up working really well. Apparently, Nancy Davis Reagan was considered for this role. Yeah, yeah. Nancy Davis was actually uh, considered as the role, which would have been funny because they actually considered Ronald Reagan to play uh, Bill Sampson. So it would have been funny if Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan ended up (laughs) in this film together uh, before they had been married. That would have been uh, just a funny little bit of uh, political history to look back on. The main uh, man, the main man, 
the main male actor character of the film uh, that interests me is this uh, Addison DeWitt. George Sanders plays the critic. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. He's the guy who kind of knows the score earliest, certainly, in the film. I, I think, you know, he is a uh, he is used to looking at stories and kind of digging, right? I mean, he's a, he's a press person. Now, granted, he's a critic. He reviews uh, shows, but he's he doesn't get sold by the glamour and the glitz of these actors, right? I mean, he's he just wants to see good stories and stuff, but he he can read people. And that's what's so great about him is the way that he reads Eves. And when he has that conversation with her, he's just like, who do you take me for? You know, this is Addison. Uh, you know, I'm not one of your little blind friends. Whatever that conversation is, it's just so interesting. The way that he takes control of everything and really ends up becoming the person who's kind of running Eve. Really interesting character. And George Sanders was the perfect person to play him. I think so, too. Other actors that stand out for you, those are the big four for me. Uh, that I got most excited about on screen. Although I will add um, that Thelma Ritter plays uh, Bertie Coonan, uh, a young Thelma Ritter, and she is uh, just delightful to see on screen, even though her part is fairly small. You know, I always love Thelma Ritter and pretty much everything that she's in. She's kind of the same character, but I love her all the same. She's always that kind of smart-mouthed, uh, sarcastic character and she's just great she does it great here so i love her here marilyn monroe of course she's she's great here in her little part uh you know her you know why do they always look like rabbits or whatever you know she says she's just great she's always a delight to see so they're great uh you know hugh marlowe gary merrill the two guys i mean they're fine i i don't get wowed by either of them this really is uh, a film about um margot and eve and addison and karen i find this was a Daryl Zanuck flick. Well, we we talked Zanuck before. I mean, uh, not this particular Zanuck, but I mean, this Zanuck really shows that he is a guy who knows how to make movies. You know, he he gets in, he helps fix things with the script, and uh, it helps with the edit, and he does it here. I mean, he really there are plenty of stories out there about how Zanuck really kind of helped Mankiewicz shape this story and find the right way to tell it. Uh, you know, he's a great person to have on board. He does good here. And you got to say, it's fun having a movie that actually references him, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's delightful, right? Uh, I love the uh, love the meta 50s movies. Uh, n yes. The same cannot so much be said for Milton Krasner as cinematography. It's uh, nothing really fantastic uh, stands out here. Yeah, I mean, we kind of mentioned it with Mankiewicz as far as not yeah. being a visual director. And, you know, I, I don't know much about Milton Krasner and his body of work, but it doesn't stand out. It didn't really say uh, that he was, you know, pushing himself to do much in any way that was interesting. I don't, I don't know if I can blame that on Milton. I don't know if that's really something that I can pin to Mankiewicz. But, you know, knowing Mankiewicz's history, I, I think it's probably falling in more in his court. Well, um, you know, to his credit, Milton Krasner, Seven Year Itch, uh, How the West Was Won, An Affair to Remember. Uh, he's He's got 161 credits. Uh, up until uh, his last work in 1977, uh, so the guy has certainly been around. Uh, but it is he's it been does busy. he's been busy. Uh, but, but I don't think any of those looked great either. <laughs> no, I don't think there's I don't think there's necessarily a a, a stamp, a no. a particular Milton Krasner stamp on these things. But a, a, an impressive body of work all the same. Uh, 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 definitely. Can we call out the unbelievably bad rear screen rear screen projection work, even for a film shot in 1950? When uh, Eve and Addison are walking down the street uh, after uh, her rehearsal, I believe, uh, for her new show. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's terrible. I don't know. I, I think it's mostly a timing issue. <laughs> it's just like the background is just moving much faster than they're actually walking. But, <laughs> oh. It's just so the bad. Steps, the steps are off. <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. But even the car, even the great, uh, the car stuff was not great. No. It, overall, the yeah rear, yeah, rear screen just didn't work. Production design. Now, production design was done by George Davis and Lyle Wheeler. But I think the person we need to shout out for this particular element is Fred Simpson, the prop master. He actually did the Sarah Siddons Award for Distinguished Achievement, which I would give to you. If I could, if I had one, you would. Well, want. 
Thank you. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. Of course, to actually win a Sarah Siddons Award, you have to actually be performing on stage in Chicago. That's how it works now. But yeah, this was a fictional award that Mankiewicz came up with. And uh, because of the film and the statue that uh, that Simpson designed, it is now a real award. It started in 1952. And uh, yeah, they uh, they actually have been giving it out ever since. And they they gave uh, Betty Davis an honorary one in 1973. Celeste Holm won one in 68. Um, it's just so funny that this piece of this film became this real thing. And now, I mean, it's still going. You know, it's uh, still an award that an actor or actress uh, receives every year from the Sarah Siddons Society. I think this is so great because uh, the real Sarah Siddons was the she was a Welsh actress in uh, lived from 1755 to 1831, uh, and she was, uh, according to Wikipedia, she's the tragedienne of the 18th century. Uh, her most famous uh, role, apparently, was Lady Macbeth, uh, the character that she apparently made her own, uh, but uh, they make no mention in her uh, biography that uh, this award was fictitious and is now real, uh, they just say that the Sarah Siddons Society continues to present the Sarah Siddons Award in Chicago every year to a prominent actress. I think that's a riot. So funny. Costumes? Well, a lot. Uh, the, the costume work was generally good, but I want to call out Edith Head, who did the uh, the costume for Betty Davis herself in this film. We've already talked about Edith Head. Uh, you know, we've talked about The Sting in particular, but she did Rear Window. She did Vertigo. In fact, she has over 500 costume credits in her career, 35 Oscar nominations, eight wins. She is the most honored costume designer and woman in Academy Award history to date. And, of course, you'll remember she's the model for The Incredibles' Edna Mode. Edna Mode. <laughs> darling. Love love Edith Head, darling. Yes, she's fantastic. Uh, this was shot not in New York? Yeah, for a film that takes place in New York, it's interesting that pretty much nothing was shot in New York except for some second unit shots. Um, everything was filmed on stages in L.A. except for all the theater work, which was filmed on a stage in Fran- San Francisco. Go San Francisco. Who knew? Uh, who knew? Uh, the editing uh, is uh, another prominent woman in Hollywood, Barbara McLean. Uh, Zana called her one of the best editors in town. She was one of only eight female editors working in Hollywood in the 30s. Uh, she'd already won an Academy Award for editing work on Wilson in 44, and uh, she became, in 49, Fox's editing division chief in 1949, retired in 1969. So a hell of a career uh, in a, a male-dominated uh, industry uh, for a, a very talented editor. That is fantastic. It's nice to hear, and uh, you know, it's great that so many female editors uh, continue to this day. Right. Only eight. Eight, yeah. Andy. I've got more fingers than that. What'd you think of Alfred Newman's uh, score? Oh, man. I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was it's great. A, it was diabolical and sweet. It's a, it's a really solid score. He really kind of found a way to have that kind of romantic draw that you've got that... Uh, that solid theme, but yes, it does almost have like a noirish minor, uh, you know, track that it kind of takes sometimes. I think Newman did just an exemplary job here with this score. I think he did too. And there are these certain be- beats, right? These moments when, for example, Eve is talking. She's been serving Margot breakfast, you know, in bed, and and she is. They're talking about, uh, you know, Bill's birthday. And there's this moment where the music is lovely and lilting and sweet and major. And then on the line, I sent him a telegram myself sequences. There's this like major to minor progression that is so subtle as they move around to Birdie's reaction and to Margot's reaction. It becomes dire so fast. And I just I got the chills, just chills watching this one. It reminds me of the Doctor Strange score of Giacchino's Doctor Strange score, which was much more psychedelic. But it does have this same sort of loop looping progression of fourths to change our key in the middle of its main melodic uh, element. And I thought it was um, it was super appropriate for, for that film, the way the music sort of eats itself. Uh, and uh, I, I heard the same thing in Newman's score here. It's just really perfect for the story. Yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, it, it did pretty well uh, in award seasons, you might say. 
You might say, yes. This film received 14 Oscar nominations, and it actually held that record until 1997 with Titanic, which is kind of crazy yeah. that uh, that this film was the one. Uh, you know, Ben-Hur, I think, had the, the record to have won the most Oscars um, until, I can't remember if it's Titanic or Lord of the Rings, but... Um, yeah, this film held the record for the most nominations. It was also the only film in Oscar history uh, to receive four female acting nominations. And uh, I think that still is true to this day, which is kind of crazy. That is crazy. It, uh, Yeah, it ended up uh, getting 14 nominations and it received six Oscars. It won for Best Supporting Actor, George Sanders, Best Director, uh, Joey from The Block, uh, also who won for Best Screenplay. Edith Head and Charles Lemaire won for Best Costume Design. Thomas T. Moulton won for Best Sound Recording. And, of course, Zanuck won for Best Picture. It uh, The other nominations, um, there's a little bit of uh, interesting stuff going on as far as the Best Actress Award goes. Betty Davis was nominated for Best Actress. Anne Baxter actually kind of petitioned Fox to get her a Best Actress nomination rather than a Best Supporting Actress nomination. And uh, they gave it to her. And, you know, we've already talked about our thoughts about her performance versus Betty's and what Joe thought and everything. Um, But a lot of people felt that Anne should have stayed as a Best Supporting Actress, considering the the bigness of Margot's role in the film. And they felt that because of that, and the fact that Gloria Swanson was nominated the same year for Sunset Boulevard, all of the people, uh, you know, ended up canceling each other out. And Judy Holliday won for Born Yesterday, who was nowhere near what everybody thought should have won for Best Actress. Who's talking about that win today? Right, exactly. <laughs> so... That's how these things work sometimes, uh, which is too bad. But yeah, Celeste Holm was nominated for uh, Supporting Actress, along with Thelma Ritter, for her part that pretty much ends halfway through the film, but obviously she stands out. They both lost to Josephine Hull for Harvey. And uh, then we have uh, Milton Krasner was nominated for Best Black and White Cinematography. I find that interesting considering... Our thoughts on him, but uh, he did get a nomination. Uh, luckily, he did lose uh, to Robert Krasker for The Third Man, which I would say is an absolutely better looking film. I just Much better uh, looking uh, film. really yeah. love that movie. Um, the Best Art Direction Set Decoration in Black and White uh, was nominated but lost to Sunset Boulevard. I'd say that's also a fair loss. Yeah. Yeah, And uh, let's see, Barbara McLean was nominated for Best Editing. We've already talked about her, but it lost to King Solomon's Minds. And uh, Alfred Newman's score was nominated, but it lost to Franz Waxman for Sunset Boulevard. So, you know, I I can't argue much with the losses um, other than Best Actress. I agree with that. What about uh, sequels, prequels, uh, other remakes? This, you know, thematically, this story is all over the place. But in terms of the direct uh, relationship to All About Eve, yeah, this is definitely a story that uh, that kind of has been told a variety of times in different ways. But it was really the inspiration for the uh, stage musical Applause in 1970 that uh, Lauren Bacall uh, played the role of Margot Channing. And it was, uh, you know, best musical. It was uh, just, it played for a very long time on Broadway. And an interesting note, when uh, when Anne Bancroft, uh, dis- or, sorry, when Lauren Bacall, I don't know where Anne Bancroft came from, when Lauren <laughs> Bacall left the show, Anne Baxter, of all people, is the person who came in to take over the role of Margot Channing, which <laughs> seems <laughs> seems awfully fitting. That's awesome. Oh, I wonder That's if the girl who played Phoebe came in to take over after Yeah, Sheila. to take over after Anne Baxter. That's great. <laughs> Um, what else do we have? There was a, there was a, a, a bit of censorship. I actually don't know anything about this. What was it? Well, it was attempted censor- censorship. They wanted some stuff uh, kind of cut from the film. The censors were concerned about some elements. You know, this was that kind of a high point for censors wanting to change things. Um, an interesting one was that Margot was smoking in bed. And I, it was like the cigarette board or something like that was really, really nervous. I guess I don't know if there had been a 
just a whole bunch of people dying from smoking in bed at this particular point in time, but they really wanted that cut because they were really concerned that people were going to see Betty Davis smoking in bed and want to do the same thing. Um, they obviously didn't cut that from the film. In fact, they didn't cut any of these things that these guys were concerned about. Um, there was, weirdly, when, you know how Max, the the producer for the play, He's always having heartburn, and he he asks Margot if she has any uh, um, uh, baking soda or whatever he calls it. I can't remember what he mm-hmm. calls it, but uh, they go into the kitchen, and she mixes some with water, and he drinks it, and he burps, and uh, she's like, "Oh, that works fast on you," or whatever. They were shocked by that—that that somebody <laughs> burps on screen. <laughs> they wanted that cut. <laughs> 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 Likewise, Marilyn Monroe has a line when she's looking at the mink coat and she's like, oh, what I would do for a coat like that. They were really kind of shocked that she says that. There were a few others, but it's just, you know, it's a sign of the time that things like that they were really looking at. Gosh, we shouldn't say that in the film. But I also think that it's a sign of the time that these guys chose not to not to change it and it ended up being okay. How to do at the box office after all these... Uh these great award successes. Well, All About Eve, uh, it uh, it had a budget of about $1.4 million, which is about $14 million in today's dollars. Um, it opened opposite the Clark Gable, Barbara Stanwyck vehicle to please a lady, as well as Jimmy Stewart with his invisible rabbit friend Harvey on October 13th, 1950. That's right, Friday no the 13th. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, but must have been a lucky day for Eve because it ended up grossing $8.4 million which is about $84 million uh, in today's dollars, making it number two at the box office in 1950, just after King Solomon's Mines, which seems weird to me, but that's what it was. Uh, but this puts Eve at an adjusted profit per finished minute of 506739 Uh Well, it was, a, it was a good watch, Andy, and I am excited, actually. I am excited for us to rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. Search for All About Eve and uh, go ahead and bring it up in your own account. You can find our account uh, and match them up. And let's see how your ranked list matches our ranked list. We would love to hear what's up first. Oh, Pete, it's the Road Warrior block. What are we going to do? All About Eve or the Road Warrior? I would Andy, say the Road Warrior, but I'm feeling guilty about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You know what, Andy? I I think I have to say all about Eve. And I don't I feel like I'm not guilty about it. This is a it was a terrific experience. I really enjoyed watching this movie. No, absolutely. I am totally fine saying all about Eve even though I I think Road Warrior is probably higher on my chart, but I am feeling like all about Eve deserves to be higher. <laughs> okay. So there. <laughs> all about Eve or Three Amigos. All About Eve for me. I would probably watch Three Amigos first, but All About Eve is the better film. All right. All About Eve or Aliens? Aliens. It's going to be Aliens. Yeah. It's going to be Aliens. Yeah. All About Eve or L.A. Confidential? L.A. Confidential. Boy, I haven't talked about that one in a while. (sighs) I might say All About Eve here, Pete. Mm, Andy, L.A. Confidential. Come on, man. I know. That's one of our favorites. I know, but so is this. I think I'm doing it. For I'm real? Take it, take it to the mats, yeah. All right, let's do it. Are you ready? All right. The, just think of the last shot, and then LA Confidential has kind of like, well, Russell Crowe did it. Look, he was dead, but look, he's miraculously alive. <sighs> I'm going to say all about Eve. <laughs> that's a pretty chicken poop way to do it, though. <laughs> like, that's a lame, that is a lame comparison. Uh, it probably is, but it, it just hit me, you know, as far as the endings go. So I'm st- I'm okay, sticking all, right. all about Eve. All right, all right. Let's see. Right, let's see how you do here. Okay. Uh, uh, one, one, two, two three, three papers, oh. as it should be. I don't know. I'd say as it shouldn't be, but that's okay. Uh, a little Edith Head competition here. All about Eve or the Sting? Oh, I'm going to say the Sting. I'm going to say all about Eve. Really? Yeah. Oh man, I did have more fun watching The Sting. I yes, I I I still would say all about Eve. I think it's just biting, smart, incredibly uh, uh strong filmmaking. Okay. Uh I I'm 
I'm not really f- that firmly. I'm so not that firmly. To all about Eve? I'm going to give it to I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to all okay. about Eve. Okay. All right. Yeah. All about Eve or the Philadelphia story. All about Eve. All about Eve. Yes, indeed. All about Eve or Moneyball, Pete. Moneyball, Moneyball. Totally oh. Moneyball. Totally Moneyball. Moneyball. I'm going to say All About Eve. Oh, Andy, no way. Okay, ready? Well, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. No, I think I'm going to say All About Eve. Yeah. All right, ready? Why would you tease me like that? That was uh, not just, a tonal I, shift I expected. No, it, I'm going to think interestingly, about it. No, All About Eve. Well, we just talked about, uh, we just ranked it against Philadelphia Story, which made me think of our wonderful conversation with Steve Miner and how much he loved Moneyball and his thoughts about Brad Pitt and his performance and all that. So I, all yeah. that came into my head all of a sudden in a rush, but I'm still going to go with All About Eve. Like the hot kiss at the end of a wet fist, Andy. <laughs> yes, indeed. Here you go. Here we go. All right. One, one two, two, three, three rock. Man. Mm, I could deal with the devil, baby. You're crushing it what <laughs> just happened next up we have all about eve or the fly our most recent listener's choice i'm gonna say all about eve i you know andy i am gonna say all about eve as well well pete that puts it at number 54 on our flick chart there I, you, you know, go i think that's a pretty good spot I, it could warrant being a little higher but i think that's fine i think it's a great spot for it it's it's higher, but I feel like I did my part, Andy. I it would be lower <laughs> if I hadn't won those two rounds. It would be lower. So your final no, assessment it, it would be you know, higher if I won because it would have beaten LA Confidential. Oh no, you're right. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Well, I'm I am <laughs> so, sorry about that, but I can't yes. I stand by those wins. Those those were those were principled wins. Well, if it helps, Lost the Confidential is only three three movies higher. Than this, so. <laughs> it does. It does help. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, anyway, this was a great watch. I'm so glad we did this, and uh, and that we're I'm 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 back on the rails. I am on the rails <laughs> for Betty Davis. This for me was it was an easy four and a half star movie on Letterbox.com. Slash uh, really four and a half. Yeah, yeah. that's it. This is total five star. This is after all the praise you gave it. Four and a half just struck me funny. I, really, this is a total five star film. An absolute five star film. All right, I'll, it's a five star film then. Let's make it a five star film. I'm going to give you an extra half star of love. The Andy <laughs> oh, Nelson half star of love, courtesy of Andy uh, Nelson. All right, trademark Andy it. Nelson. You you win. Five, <laughs> trademark Andy Nelson. Yes, indeed, that is mine. Thank you. Yeah, so funny. That's right. You know what? It's my birthday weekend, Andy. I'm feeling really <laughs> generous. Funny. Oh, good. I'm glad the generosity is flowing toward Eve. Oh, it's all over. (laughs) All over Eve. Where do we go? uh, Where do we go next? We are wrapping up our uh, our Betty Davis series, which has been a lot of fun. And I guess I'm hoping that I'm convincing you that she's a fantastic actress. Uh, But yeah, we're going to be jumping up into the 60s and we're ending it with a, a little crazy turn with her and Joan Crawford trying to find out whatever happened to baby Jane. Yeah, that's right. We're going to wrap up this uh, Andy's Battle Royale of Betty Davis movies. <laughs> Until oh, then, I got to go to bed. Well, I'm going myself. Tuck me in. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. I'm totally lying there. Amazon hasn't giveth anything on this movie. <laughs> These are terrible well, reviews. Everybody loves it. That's the problem. Just... <laughs> uh, you want? You, do you want to go first? Yes, I have. I have the one uh, low score that is a two star by Christine Williams, who uh, says all the smoke will make you choke. <laughs> nice and alliterative. <laughs> I felt that this old movie was quote, slightly overacted, unquote. All the cigarette smoking that went on during the entire movie made me want to gag. I am sorry that I bought it because I won't care to watch it again. 
Hmm. Okay there, Christine. Okay. I can't tell if it's because of the smoking that she doesn't want to watch it, or if it's the slightly overacted bit that that is why she doesn't want to watch it. But either way, I guess she's upset that she bought it. I, I just appreciate the fact that she's an anti-smoking activist, and that has <laughs> exactly. used a, has chosen her platform of Amazon product reviews to make her stand. <laughs> Welcome oh, to so Little funny. Bighorn, kid. <laughs> You're right. finally made it the big time. Uh, I've got Terry, who actually watched this on format DVD back in April of last year, gave it three stars. And uh, Terry's comment, I-, I think, is demonstrative of many of the comments below the three star ranks on Amazon. He says, Good book. <laughs> oh, boy. Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, I know. You're telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. In Season 6, our Disease Films series had adaptations like The Omega Man, based on I Am Legend, The Andromeda Strain, Children of Men, and Blindness. I Am Legend is so much better than The Omega Man. What about the Will Smith version? Don't get me started. For our This Is Real Life Jack series, we talked Black Hawk Down and Seabiscuit, some great true stories based on fantastic books. And we had more listeners' choices, like The Fly, The Emigrants, and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. You just did a series on The Fly on the Sitting in the Dark podcast. Did you read the original material? Wasn't watching every Fly movie enough? (laughs) Our Big Betty Davis series featured adaptations like The Little Foxes, Now Voyager, All About Eve, and whatever happened to baby jane are you calling betty davis big only in personality and force <laughs> she is a force to be reckoned with <laughs> we talked about the entire the godfather trilogy of course iconic page to screen even if it is just the one mario puzo book I wonder if coppola will ever make the sicilian we also had some zhang yumu adaptations with judo and raise the red lantern absolutely gorgeous movies and don't forget the Hughes Brothers series with From Hell, based on the graphic novel. Brilliant material. Kelly Reichardt gave us Wendy and Lucy and Certain Women, adapted from short stories. Plus more Hayao Miyazaki as we tackled Howl's Moving Castle. Find all these books and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the show. Get the full list of adapted films that we've covered at thenextreel.com slash originals and start your next read today. <laughs>